right? And then so partake. And you think the words of this song here about a sinner like me. We have that internal obligation to just examine ourselves and to recognize a sinner like me, Lord, all that you've done for me. And so today we're going to continue in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. So if you can open your Bibles there and uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Our sermon today is titled Cleaning House. So, you know, we're going to say a prayer and then we're going to get to it. Lord, we just thank you so very much for your grace. And today we pray that the houses of our heart and the house of the Lord would be cleansed by your spirit. And we pray and ask these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Cleansing house, that's what it's all about. Mike, it's not that kind of cleansing. I, I, now, we talked about this earlier, Mike. Uh, we, so this is one of our elders who apparently got a little ambitious when he saw the title. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for cleansing our house for us. But uh, right in front, you missed a spot right there. Thank, th thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe it didn't go over as well as we thought. All right, but. Uh. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the expression, first things first? It's an idiom. It's an expression that means to deal with the most important or urgent task before moving on to lesser ones, perhaps. It emphasizes the importance of setting priorities and doing things in their proper order. So as we turn to Matthew chapter 21, we're going to go through uh, verses 12 through 17 this morning, and then we're going to partake in the Lord's table. But it's in this section of scripture that we see that Jesus is setting some things in order, first things first, so to speak. He's prioritizing things. Remember last week he had come in riding in on a donkey. Remember that? And they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But today, we're going to see Jesus setting things in priority, beginning first with God's house. And then, secondly, we're going to see the compassion that he has, as his priority was always to be filled with mercy and compassion for those that are in need, and then childlike faith. I can remember growing up as a young child, I'm going to have to move this down a little bit. Can you hear me thumping a little bit? There we go. All right, there you go. It was Easter, man, and it has... Oh, all right, all right, sorry. <laughs> Melissa and I did a rap in 1992. Didn't quite make the hits, but anyway. I was a young child growing up, and uh, I, raised, I was raised Catholic in upstate New York, and I, I can remember attending church services alone. You know, my parents had gotten divorced when I was younger, but I, I, I knew that I wanted to be close to the Lord at a very early age. And so I made it to church every Sunday morning, and if you're familiar with the Catholic Church, they have crucifix inside. We, we have a cross because the cross is empty because Jesus is no longer hanging on the cross, Amen. right? He's risen from the dead. But my spiritual formation was I go to church and there's a crucifix there and all I needed to know was I wanted to sit right under it. I wanted to be close to Jesus. Not only that, but I learned something very important and that is to have an absolute reverence for the house of the Lord. After all, it's God's house. There was only one other house that I had such reverence for and that was Grandma Fitz's. Don't touch anything there, you know, she, she, she was pretty tough. But in this passage that we're going to read this morning, Jesus is going to be setting some things in order. He's going to be cleaning house. He's going to do it in a most righteous and, well, he'll have what I like to refer to as a righteous anger toward those who had made the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, a common marketplace. These merchants were squatters. Anybody hear about the squatters this week here? We've been hearing a lot about them. But these merchants 
you see, I call them squatters because what they ended up doing is it was a time, obviously, the Passover's there. The, the, there's people in Jerusalem from all over, all over. And they, they would come with their coins and, you know, and these money changers would sit at the table and say, oh, well, you have money from, oh, from that district? Well, you know, the exchange rate for that is five to one. Oh, oh, you, you have an offering, you sacrifice? Oh, but oh, those, oh, those little turtle doves, they'll never make it. You're not, you're not going to give that to God, are you? You know, and so these, these people became squatters in the front of the house of the Lord. They were doing business. And I know that, I, and I'm not going to go on a rant, but, but I know that the leaders of our church know that I've shared with them too many times that the church is not business. It's ministry. Doesn't mean that we don't have business to take care of, but, but the ministry is more important. But what we're going to see is Jesus is going to tip the tables over here. Then we're going to see Jesus have compassion on the, on the lame and the infirmed are going to come and be healed. Compassion. Remember I shared the definition for compassion with you a few weeks ago? It's where you can look at another and say, it's your pain in my heart. I, I get the sense of that. Growing up, I can remember my uncle who was a deacon in the church. He would, he would take me from place to place. As, as a deacon, he would go and do errands for some of the seniors at our church. And he would pick me up on Saturday mornings and I would go and, in the IGA grocery store, pick up the groceries, and we would go and deliver them. Or maybe we would go and mow somebody's lawn. Or maybe we would just do, go and you know, clean windows. Whatever it was. Whatever the practical needs were. I remember one day, my Uncle Chuck and I, we, we, spent, uh, we went up to a senior's house. He lived on the third floor. He was a hoarder. Do you know what a hoarder is? This gentleman living on the third floor in a very low rent area. He was a hoarder. He had rats inside of his house, his apartment. Third story. We went up and down those stairs all day long, beginning at 8 o'clock, and didn't, didn't get done until 7 o'clock at night. At the end of the day, my Uncle Chuck looked at me and said, you know why we did this? I said, because he needed the help. He goes, because he needs to be reminded that God loves him and that God will take care of him and send people his way. Others-centered is, is where I learned, you know, at a very early age. In the text this morning, we're going to see also the healing power of Jesus, both toward the blind and the lame, and he does it with such humility. And so this, this section of scripture has so much for us to learn from. So whether you're a new believer or whether you've been walking with the Lord for a very long time, I, I hope to offend all of us <laughs> that we'd all be stirred this morning that God would richly bless us and move us. And so let's begin. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. If you have a Bible there, it might say Jesus cleanses the temple. As a header, verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you, you have made it a den of thieves. Verse 14, Then the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and how the children were crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never heard out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So in this section of scripture, we have some uh, interesting uh, conversation to go about. And the first thing is, as Jesus comes in riding on the, on the donkey, the first thing he does is he goes to the temple. 
And he has to turn the tables over so you can immediately see the friction. It goes from high praise to Hosanna in the highest to the friction of Jesus confronting these money changers and these uh, men and, that are selling doves out in front of the house of the Lord. And Jesus turns it over and he says, My father's house is a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. You're squatting. And then, after cleansing it out, the blind and the lame, they came and Jesus began to heal them. And again, you see the, the praises coming out and you see more friction because of the indignant scribes and the priests. Can you just imagine this? These religious types are the ones that where, you know, wonderful things are happening. The blind are, are being healed and the lame are being able to walk and they're being, and, and these guys are indignant toward this. That's what happens with religiosity and tradition. You see, Jesus wasn't one of them. So how could God ever use him like that? No, 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 no. And then they became so indignant at the Hosanna, the son of David. He's no son of David, these scribes and the priests would think to themselves. And they were outraged and they said, shut them up. And then Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. Have you not heard out of the babes, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? So as we read through this section of scripture, it's a powerful reminder of us about Jesus' zeal for the house of the Lord, his compassion for those in need, and the importance for each of us to have a childlike faith. To not be so religious that we become permanent fixtures, so to speak, spiritual squatters in the house of the Lord. From this passage, we are challenged to approach God with a heart of reverence and trust, allowing him to cleanse and renew us, and to ask to have our hearts be filled with the same compassion for others that Jesus demonstrated. What a day that would be, huh? If all that were to happen all at once to us, what, what kind of a life would we have? What kind of joy would we be experiencing in our life if the, the, the compassion of God and the mercy of God were flowing through us in such a way where, where we see the blind and the lame all of a sudden get up and walk and walk away seeing? What, a, what kind of a day that would be? What kind of a day would it be if we were to take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit of God for a fresh sense of his presence in our life. This fresh wind, so to speak. This fresh zeal in our life. Remember a couple weeks ago, I mentioned something about coming to church and you come to church in one of two ways. You can come to church as a spectator, you know, seeing if Truax is going to be able to enunciate all the words right and be funny just enough, get us out on time. All the nice decorations, you come to church as a spectator, or do you come, as, come to church as an ex-spectator? Maybe there was a little bit of spiritual blindness, and, but I'm coming, Lord, to see. I want you to show me the things I can't see. I want to be renewed in my spirit. I want to be challenged in my walk. I don't want to become a spiritual squatter in your house. You know, I come, I sit at the same pew every week. Ooh. I'm looking at the splash zone right here. <laughs> when I say it like that, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. What I mean, though, is this here. Th there were men that were selling and exchanging money as part of their business as usual routine in their life, and they were doing it at the house of the Lord. And so I think one of the takeaways that I want us to look at and say, wait a second, do I go to church as a business as usual kind of a thing? I sit at the same place, I sing my favorite songs, I bounce over to the fellowship hall and I go home. It's business as usual. I'm going to challenge you there today. Last week, our service was so wonderful. The Lord had done something so wonderful. Our attendance at the church has never been higher. God is doing something good. There's great victories, and there's, here's the thing, but with great ministry, there's also great, you know, challenges, but that's okay. When we come to the house of the Lord, though, it's not going to be business as usual. God's got something that he wants to do, and he is doing it. If we're open to it, if our eyes are open to it, maybe we become spiritually complacent, and we don't see it, and our eyes are a little bit blind to the things of God. Today, we can be healed of that. 
Today, it's a little lame. Maybe I've been a little lame in my walk. I just kind of squat along. I, I go along, get along. It's business as usual when I go to church. Maybe, maybe it's time to rise up and start marching a little bit more. In this section of scripture, we have some very personal applications to pay close attention to. And the first one is how we approach God with a heart full of reverence when we come to his house. Allowing Jesus to cleanse and renew our hearts, to be filled with compassion for others, and to dedicate our life anew every day in worshiping and seeking out the presence of God. So there's some cross-references that, that, that we can put up there. We're going to try and do some of those. I don't know if we're going to get through all of them before communion. But what we're going to see, though, is Jesus is cleansing the temple. And just as he desires to cleanse the temples, Jesus is also desiring to cleanse and remove uh, the, the things in our heart that clutter up or hinders us from really truly having a fully on fire, compassionate relationship with him. Our lives, our hearts are to be like the temple. They should be filled with a, a, a heart that is totally dedicated to worshiping God, seeking his presence, rather than being preoccupied with worldly concerns. And then to have that childlike faith. And you know, one of the things that we see about childlike faith is children are, they are less likely to question things. Their unquestioning faith is what they have. And, and let that teach us a valuable lesson today as we approach God with the same childlike faith and trust. You see, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 7, uh, 12 through 17, we, we come across the references where Jesus is cleansing the temple, he's healing the blind, and, and the children are singing out, and Jesus is putting the religious people in their place, while, all of a sudden, while at the same time, he is setting the right things right. He enters the temple and he drives out those buying and selling. And so you can see some cross-references there in the Gospel of Mark and in John as well. Mark eleven fifteen 15 through 17, it says, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the table of the money changers and uh, the seats of those who sold doves. When you look at John's Gospel in chapter 2, uh, uh, it says this here. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out. By the way, Mike and I earlier when we practiced this little uh, stunt with the, uh, with the uh, vacuum cleaner, he suggested I get a whip of cords. I said no. He drove them out of the temple, right? Verse 16, and he said to those who sold doves, these, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Keeping things in context, remember, this is the events of the final week of Christ's ministry on earth. Before he goes to the cross, would suffer, die, would bury, and then, be ro and then would rise again. But this, these will be the final actions of him be just before the cross. Where he would fulfill his mission of rede redeeming all of mankind. His death and his burial, his resurrection. Jesus is preparing the church for his departure. He is setting things in order. And so, I'll ask you this here. Just a personal application today. Have you set things in order? You see, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. And why did he say that to his disciples? Because he had just told them a little while longer, I'm not going to be with you, I'm going to go. And this was troubling to the disciples. And so this is why he says, let not your hearts be troubled. But here's the thing Jesus is showing us in the, in the scripture today, maybe just a personal application about getting things in order in our lives. You know, as a pastor, one of the things I have the privilege of doing is uh, officiating memorial services from time to time. And I will honestly tell you that there are two things that make things so much easier as a pastor when you're meeting with the family of the dearly departed. And here's what we need to do. 
before you leave this earth, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to communicate to those whom you love two things. Number one, when I step over the threshold of eternity, I'm going to heaven. You don't have to guess where I am. You know, I've had to answer those questions for people before. Pastor Tony, what do you think? Is my dad in heaven? Try answering some of those questions to the, to the survivors of your loved ones. So number one, you're going to communicate. This is the best thing you can do, and I think this is the best number one thing to do, is you're going to communicate while your eyes are open to your children and to your loved ones and those that you leave behind. You don't have to guess where I am because I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by grace that I've been saved through faith that I will not go from life to death. I will go from life to eternal life in the twinkling of an eye. I'm going to be putting on incorruption in the twinkling of an eye. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to a place that's prepared just for me. Is that you, Ardith? Ardith? Ardith, hi, I see you. Okay, anyway, so the second thing you want to do, number one, I'm going to heaven. Number two, and the rest of this stuff is in a folder, and this person's the one that you need to call. They're going to take care of everything. That's it. What's going to happen to me and what's going to happen to my stuff? I say that because it's difficult from time to time. You know, when, you, when you're sitting there as a pastor and you want to have a family, you know, interview and maybe the family's a little dysfunctional and, and they don't get along and then all of a sudden the long lost, you know, son or daughter shows up, you know, because it's that time and, you know, it's difficult. So do your business. If you want to do some business today, do, make, make sure you do those kinds of business. There's, do some pre-planning if you have. It makes things a lot easier for your, for your loved ones. I, I do recommend those kinds of things. In this passage, we see several important truths, though, about Jesus and his relationship with his people. First of all, Jesus is cleansing the house. His actions of turning over the tables in the temple demonstrate his deep love and reverence for God's house. Something that we should all have. By driving out the money changers and those that are selling animals, these, these business as usual squatters, he's expressing both a righteous anger toward them and also a righteousness toward the things of God, which is the, the house of the Lord is to be a house of praise and prayer. Amen? Amen. Secondly, the significance of the temple. The temple is a symbol of God's presence among the people. That's what it was. And it's a place where the Jewish people would come to offer their sacrifices and, and to seek God's forgiveness. Remember, that's what they would do. By cleansing the temple, Jesus was not only expressing his zeal for God's house, but also declaring his authority as God's only begotten son. The temple, though, is a picture or a type of our hearts. The temple in Jerusalem was a physical structure, but the real issue for you and I today at hand was the condition or is the condition of the hearts of the people. Just as the temple had become defiled by the actions of the money changers and the sellers, so too can our hearts become defiled by sin and worldly concerns. This temple, this tent, of which the Holy Spirit dwells in, is to be kept holy. Amen? Amen? So let's do the best we can with that. Let's not be defiled by the things of this world and the worldly things and the pursuit of it, but let us be holy. Let us be set apart, sanctified. Our application is easy. Just as Jesus cleansed the temple, he desires to cleanse our hearts and to remove anything that hinders us from having a pure and right relationship with him. So is there anything today in your heart? Anything in your mind's eye or anything that might be kind of, you know, slowing you down a little bit from, from really hitting the stride that you really want, the, that you sense the Holy Spirit would have you take? 
Is there something that's kind of holding you back? Let it go. Don't, don't let the things of this world tether you to it, but let it go. Surrender to the Spirit of God and let Him take you to the places where He wants you to be, and it's great and mighty. The reasons why Jesus' actions are so important for us, Matthew chapter 21, uh, 13 says, and He said, it has been because my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. We need to keep our houses cleansed for God's purposes. Isaiah chapter 56, 7 says it like this here. Even them I will bring my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jeremiah tells us, uh, this is the cross reference, as this house which is called by my name, became a den of thieves in your eyes. Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. Malachi, verse 3, 1 through 4, you can read through there. In verse 2 it says, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when, his, when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. The application for us is our lives. We are the temples that should be dedicated to prayer and praise and worship and seeking God's presence every day. What's holding us back? From holy going forward in the things of God, dedicating ourselves to being a person of prayer. Paul says, to pray without ceasing. To praise. Let us, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let us worship. Let us, let us kiss and, and, and tell the Lord how worthy he is. That, that's what worship is. To kiss towards heaven and express how God is worthy. You are worthy, O oh Lord. The children's praise was also there. The, the religious people, they, they couldn't stand the children, you know, crying out, you know, Hosanna to the son of David. And we know that's the very first thing that, that Matthew says at the beginning of, this, of his uh, gospel. He talks about Jesus, the son of David. And they were indignant. These chief priests and the scribes, they were displeased by the children's praise. But here, here's where Jesus reads out of Psalm 8-2. It says, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants... You have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus blesses the children and has nothing to do with me making the announcement today about children's ministry, but let me just say it like this here. It, Jesus says it like this in, uh, in Mark 10. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. But surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Jesus telling us to have childlike faith, and I know that maybe some of us are in our 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and even Daryl, he's 103. <laughs> not this Daryl, but Daryl. And, and to consider yourself like a child, well, you know what? Our spirits are younger every day. It's like a Benjamin Button thing. You know, our spirit gets younger even though our bodies are getting older. Children often have a simple, unquestionable faith, meaning they're teachable. Are you? Oh. You see, that's a challenge for us. You see, for some of us, we've been walking with the Lord so long, it, it just seems like, you know, to have a, a valuable lesson to be reminded that I'm to be teachable. I thought I knew it all. Listen here, True Acts. I, I've been to, I've been to you know uh, churches where the the pastors have written books and commentaries, and I you, you're not going to impress me too much. You're not going to be able to say things that that they're, you're not going to be able to teach me anything new. Well, listen, if you came here because True Acts is a teacher, you're in trouble, because the Holy Spirit is. That's who we pray. So let us approach God with the same childlike faith and trust in Him, asking Him to renew us, to, to make us open and teachable, to cleanse us, 
so that we would be filled with the same compassion for others and the same desire to set up the priorities of our life that please Him. Consider a young child who approaches their parents with a complete trust and confidence. They don't worry about judgments or obstacles. Just like how a child would entrust their life to their parents with an unwavering faith, we too must approach our God in the same way, with the same childlike faith, trusting that He will provide for us every need and guide us through every journey. What we've seen, what is it? Number one, how about our need to approach God with a reverence, seeking His presence in our life, recognizing that Jesus is the authority, not only of the house of the Lord, but he's the authority over my life, over my house, my heart. Allowing Jesus also to cleanse and renew our hearts, removing anything that would hinder it. How about making today one of those days when we go, go before the Lord as we prepare our hearts and we, let a, uh, we examine ourselves and say, Lord, there are some things. I've been holding this back against my children or my grandchildren or my wife or my brother, my sister. Lord, I don't want to carry these things anymore. Let's dedicate our hearts, our lives to be the temple that is one that is filled with praise and prayer and worship. Rely on the power of God and the faith to heal us as well. The blind and the lame were healed. And, you know, the blind and the lame. Some of us, I know that we're older. Some of us, we've grown spiritual cataracts in our periphery. I just go to church. This is the way I understand the text. This is the way it's always going to be. This is never going to change. And so we put on our spiritual periphery. Is we're no longer open to hearing and receiving and seeing things of God. Or, or our spiritual periphery is always on the things that are wrong instead of the wonderful things that are going right. We've grown critical like that. We've grown like the religious leaders. The religious leaders were ones that were looking around and even though people were being healed, rather than celebrating with everybody about what great things God are doing, God is doing, all they're, all they're worried about is, wait a second here, that, that can't go on in here. Some of us kind of grow that spiritual cataract, isn't it, in our blindness, in our periphery. Let's pray that the Lord would renew our hearts with the compassion for others in need, approaching God with a renewed childlike faith and devotion. This morning, we see a powerful demonstration of Jesus' authority and his com compassion. He didn't let the religious ne'er-do-wells nor the, religious, the, 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 the mar merchant squatters get in his way. First things first, he cleansed the temple. And his healing of the blind and the lame. And, it, and he reminded each of us to have that childlike faith. So today we ask, are you in need of any kind of healing or restoration in your life? Are you here today as an expectator Perhaps today you're here and maybe having read through and listened to the message, maybe you're here and you're thinking, if I could just have a fresh wind and fresh fire, if I could have a fresh wind of God's Holy Spirit, you know, just breathe new life into my devotion to Him, breathe new life in my worship to Him, breathe new life, if that fresh wind, you know, of, of devotion to Him, if I could have that fresh fire, that, that new compassion to, I, I don't want to be a spiritual squatter, I don't want to come and do the same thing the same way this, and get the same results. I want to be challenged, Lord. I want to be a learner. I want to have that childlike faith. I want to be usable, Lord. If that's you today, then there's good news. You're in the house of the Lord, and he's saying, it can start right here, right now. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to flip over the complacent spiritual business as usual tables of our hearts today. Ask for that fresh wind. Ask for a fresh new prayer. Think about that. I do from time to time. I, I read a book by E.M. Bounds years ago. It changed my prayer life. And one of the things that I've, I noticed about my prayer life before reading this is I started my prayers out always with the same sentence. 
And then after reading that, and I, I, I remembered, like, oh my goodness, it's almost like I have a moat prayer. It's, it's kind of like a, a pathway, you know, and nothing wrong with it, but, but I'm going to ask today, rather than the business as usual prayer life, how about let's all of us ask the Lord for a new prayer? A new way of approaching his holy, holy, holy throne. We'll have the same instrument, prayer, absolutely, but, but in a fresh new way, a fresh prayer life. One that isn't, you know, kind of like the squatter's prayer. You know, okay, this is the prayer that I've always prayed. It's a business as usual, Lord, right? My Father's house shall be a house of prayer. Let's ask the Lord for a fresh prayer life. Perhaps it's time for the Lord to cleanse us up a little bit more in our heart's devotion. Maybe today the Lord can give us not only a new prayer, but also a new approach to devotion. We have our routines, we have our daily breads, we have our little apps, we have this, we have that. Maybe the Lord's challenging us to maybe open up a fresh new devotion. Start something new. Fresh wind, fresh fire. May today we ask the Lord to fill us up with a, a, a childlike faith, a, a renewed faith, where everything is brand new to the child. Let, let, let our walk with the Lord, even though I've been walking with Him for 40 or 50 or 60 years, let our walk with the Lord today begin to feel like I just met Him yesterday. So in closing, let us continue to seek the Lord's presence in our lives. Let us seek to be filled with His power let us express praise and, and prayers to the Lord. Let us seek His healing in our hearts and in our lives. Let us present ourselves as living sacrifices to Him, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable form of worship. And may we as believers in Jesus Christ seek to worship Him with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength in a fresh and new way. Maybe today, we can be filled again with a reverence and an awe as we consider the greatness of our God. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call upon me, and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. Let's call upon the Lord in a fresh way today, shall we? Let's pray, and then we're going to go into communion. Father, we thank you so very much for our message this morning. And we thank you for the challenge, Lord, to think like we're young kids again in the faith. Forgive us, Lord, if we become stagnant and, and complacent in our devotion and in our prayers and in our praise to you. But, Lord, thank you for the inspiration to not go another day like that. Empower us, Lord, we pray. Give us that fresh wind of your Holy Spirit. Give us that fresh fire and, and, and passion to live life for you. And we pray and ask these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.